y'all. Happy New Year's. Can't believe we got out of 2020 and now we're into 2021. Hopefully you guys had a great holiday season with the family. I know that I did. Kept it low key this year, but still had a great time. I'm looking forward to a better year this year than we had last year. But to start off this year, we have Bell Mead Bourbon. Now this is from Tennessee, actually, Nashville, Tennessee, which is why we're here at the Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery in Nashville, Tennessee. But this isn't made by Bell Mead. This is actually an MGP sourced product. So we're gonna get into this and a little bit more about what a sour mash means today. So stick with me, let's get to it. So here we have it, the Bell Mead. And this story with Bell Mead is very similar to a lot of other stories that you've probably heard in the bourbon world. But before we get to that, everybody knows before we get started, time for the tradition. I've tried to say this about four times now. Once you pour the bourbon, you can't really pour it back. So I've been very close to pouring the bourbon and I've never messed up. Time for the traditional sip so many times. So we're just gonna skip to it. Time for the traditional, cheers. It's a solid bourbon. Bell Mead here, like I said, has a story you've probably heard of with many other bourbons and I'm gonna tell it to you real quick. Bell Mead is a bourbon with pre-prohibition brand originally produced by Charles Nelson Green Distillery, shut down to prohibition. And of course, what did they have to do? Resurrect the family name or find some recipes in an old briefcase or find some bottles left under a house somewhere. But the story is prohibition shut them down. They figured out a way to resurrect the name so that they can keep that age on there. This says, you know, established 1853. Well, it was shut down for a while and then it was sold from company to company. And right now it's back, but it's sourced. It's an MGP product. It's a high rye MGP product, but they do a very good job of blending this bourbon, which we'll get into in a little. First, let's start with the mash bill on this. 64% corn, 30% rye, 6% malted barley. Now that's a high rye mash bill with a 90.4 proof bourbon. One of my favorite combinations, a high rye mash with a medium to low proof bourbon. So this is probably gonna score pretty well, at least on taste. But before we get to that, let's get into drinkability. Drinkability on this is pretty good. 90.4 proof. Got a little bit of a kick to it, but let's keep in mind this is a 30% rye, which is going to give it a little bit of a spice. As we know, that rye is going to give it a spice note, which you can get right off the bat on this. So drinkability on this, let's get one more sip and then we'll try it out. So yeah, I think drinkability on this is really good. I don't think it drinks above the proof, but I also don't think it drinks below the proof. If I were to blind taste test this and you would say, what's the proof on this? I'd probably say like 90 to 95 proof, which isn't a bad thing. It's not a bad thing that it drinks at its proof. I've just been, I think I've been lucky lately with some of the bourbons that I've had. They drink below their proof. Now, again, for this not to drink below its proof, it's not its fault. It's what its proof is. So the fact that it is a 90.4 proof and it drinks like a 90.4 proof should give it a pretty good score on drinkability, if you ask me. I'm going to give it like an 8.8 .8 on the drinkability scale because I think that's where it deserves to be. Again, it's not knockout exceptional on drinkability. If you don't want something that tastes like 90 proof, then don't buy a 90 proof bourbon. Feels like a 90 proof. I do, I do think it has a little bit more of a kick because of that high rye, which we'll get into on taste. But with a 30% rye, you expect it to have a little bit of a spice, you know, burn to it, but not much ethanol as far as that goes. So next we're gonna go into taste on this. And let me tell you, the taste on this is pretty solid. I like it a lot. And the other thing that I like about this is they're, again, very transparent. Just like last week, we had the Penelope. This week, we have a very transparent company. It says right on here, this is a blend of four barrels per batch, ranging in age from six to eight years. So we know we have a six to eight-year-old bourbon. We know what they're doing is a small batch, and this is, I guess, the quintessential small batch. This is only four barrels going into that. I mean, you think about it, how much smaller can it get? Two barrels, I guess. You have a single barrel, but then it's not a small batch. So four barrels going into a small batch is definitely going to limit what they can do flavor wise as far as hiding any bad flavors. So they have to make sure they're picking the best of the best from those barrels to make sure it's going into this. And six to eight years isn't, you know, a short time. You need at least four years to be called a straight bourbon, which I believe they do put on here. Straight bourbon. So knowing all of those things, the flavor profile on this is pretty good. You get a traditional bourbon flavor. You're not going to get anything more than that. There's no more complexity. It's your traditional vanilla, caramel, oak, a little bit of a sweet note, which doesn't seem manufactured to me. It seems more like a fruit note, something, a natural sweet. But then obviously you're going to end off with that very high, very prominent spice note because it's a 30% rye. So as for taste on this, personally, I like it a lot. I like a high rye 
medium to low proof bottle, which is what I got here. I've got a 30% rye and a 90.4 proof. One of my favorite combinations because I think the high rye spice works with the lower proof and that's just what I like. So if you like that, I think you're going to love this bottle. And I'm going to put this at like a, I'm going to give it like an 8.9 on, on taste. And I think, again, that's preference. I don't think there's anything exceptional or stand out that, or anything that stands out on this. It's not unique by any means, but it's a perfect tasting bourbon. And that's just my opinion on it. So 8.9 on taste. Last but not least, we're going to get into price on this. And the price on this is $39.99. And I think, and again, this is tough because that $40 range is really like the cutoff for these bourbons here. It's a little bit harder to find here in Pennsylvania. This one in particular wasn't in a couple of stores I had to visit, but like their reserve and their sherry casts and their cognac finishes, everything like that, I haven't even seen here in Pennsylvania. So at $40, I understand being a sourced bourbon and going through the process of only blending off four barrels and being that small of a batch when you're talking about a small batch is definitely going to raise the price on this. But uh, if you look at it, you've got dr great drinkability, you've got great taste. So can I really be mad at $40 for this? I guess not. I would like it better in that, I would even say $5 less range, that $30 to $35 range, I think is where it deserves to be. So if you're only talking a $5 difference, I can't give it a terrible score on price. I'm going to give it like an 8.2 on the price scale, and I think that's being fair with it. So as I add these scores up, let's send it over to this week's Bourbon Bomb of the Week so I can tell you exactly what a sour mash is and how that's going to affect what we're working with here, because this is a sour mash whiskey. Let's get it. So this week's Bourbon Bomb of the Week is brought to you not just by Bell Mead, but by Sour Mashes in general. Now I brought out Tennessee Sour Mash Whiskey Jack Daniels, because that's where I got my start in the whiskey world. Right here on Bell Mead, Sour Mash Whiskey as well. We have a couple up here that also put Sour Mash on their label. And the question is, what is a Sour Mash exactly? And that's what we're going to get into. So basically when you distill alcohol, you put a mash bill together. In this particular case, we've talked about it at 64% corn. 30% uh, rye and 6% malted barley. You put that in, you put your hot water in, you go through the fermentation process, and you distill out your alcohol. Now, after you take the alcohol out, you're still left with all of this mash, all of this leftover, what's in there with the hot water and everything. If it's a five gallon mash bill, you might actually have like four and a quarter of gallons left. And to be considered a sour mash, you have to take 25% of what's left and transfer that into your next mash. So you're gonna take 25% of what was left in that pot, left in that still, you're gonna transfer it over, add it to the other 75% of what you plan to use for your next one, and that's how you get a sour mash. Basically, it's just adding extra proteins, extra enzymes, extra dead yeast, which the new yeast is gonna to use to feed off of. And the main reason that you do that is because it's gonna it's gonna give you a more consistent product. So the reason every time you drink Jack Daniels, it tastes like Jack Daniels, is because it's a sour mash. If they used a different mash bill every time or the same mash bill, even if it's the same percentages, but they didn't add that last mash into it, the sour mash, then you wouldn't have the consistency of product that you're gonna get, which I think is what really helps the Bell Mead product because they're using only four barrels to get this product. They're getting a more consistent product because they're using a sour mash rather than the fact that they're only using four barrels for their small batch. Generally, that's what a sour mash is. There's obviously a lot more chemistry that goes into it, which we won't get into here, but 25% of the previous mash is used to create the next mash. That's a sour mash. Cheers. So that's what a sour mash is. We love to learn something new every week. So make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can not only keep up with the list, but learn something new as we go along with it. But as for the Bell Mead, it's going to fall in at number four at an 8.633 repeating. We'll just call it 8.63, dropping it right below, I believe, the Four Roses small batch and right above the 1792. Not a bad spot for it. I think it's where it belongs. If it was a little bit cheaper, I think it would be even higher on the list. And if they can make it a little bit easier to find, I wouldn't mind that either. But not a bad spot for it. Fourth on the list. Hopefully you guys like this, but make sure you check out my Instagram, Bourbon of the Week. Every Tuesday at 4 p.m., we're going to drop a new picture of the bourbon that we're going to review. So yesterday I dropped this picture where you can guess what you think the score is going to be. If you guess closest to the score, I'm going to give you a shout out on the video. We're also going to enter you in a prize drawing once a month for the four people that guessed right that month. So you can be entered in that as well. So make sure you follow me at Bourbon of the Week on Instagram. And as for last week, we had, let me think about it. That's right, it was Bauer Mark who guessed an 8.24 on our 8.27 Penelope from last week. 
So shout out to you, Bauer Mark, a.k.a. Mark Bauer, good friend of mine from college. You won this week's Bourbon of the Week guest, and you're going to be entered in a drawing to win one of our fantastic prizes. Once a month, you can get entered in these drawings. So make sure you follow me at Bourbon of the Week. But in the meantime, please don't drink and drive. Drink responsibly. And as always, wash your hands. Pandemic's getting better, y'all, but it ain't over yet. We're almost there. Cheers.